Our next speaker is the Vice Chief of U.S. Space Operations. He is not only responsible for the $30 billion per year of U.S. Space Force funding, but he and his boss, General Saltzman, rolled out last week the re-optimizing for great power competition from a U.S. Space Force perspective. Please welcome Vice Chief General Michael Goodland. Can you guys hear me? Oh, I can hear myself, so that's good. So uh, we'll see if you guys clap when I get done, as much as you clapped when I got up here. So uh, a good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all uh, for being here today. So today, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, really talking to you about what is the security environment that we're dealing with today, and what is the Space Force doing to ensure we can guarantee the use of space for the generations to come. So if you guys have heard me talk, I always start off with the threat. I start off with the threat because the threat is the why. It is why we stood up the Space Force in 2019, and it is why you all are here today. So it kind of drives the dialogue going forward, so that's where I always start. It is no secret that for over the past dec decade, the People's Republic of China, and to some extent, the Russian Federation, have significantly increased their ability to directly challenge US and allied space capabilities. Not only have they demonstrated the intent to deny our use of space for peace and for defense, but in many instances, they have also proven the capability to do so also. And they continue to demonstrate their willingness to go against international norms of behavior and to do so in an increasingly unsafe and unprofessional manner. Both Russia and China openly are developing and testing counter space capabilities today. Each country has demonstrated the use of kinetic weapons to destroy satellites on orbit, polluting the space environment for everyone by scattering thousands of debris fragments and endangering hundreds of satellites. In November of 2021, Russia destroyed one of their satellites on orbit by launching a missile at it and creating over 1,500 pieces of debris. That debris cloud caused the seven members that are aboard the International Space Station to take shelter multiple times throughout the station's orbit as it was intersecting with the debris. On board were four Americans, a German, and two Russian cosmonauts. These aggressive actions and their willingness to put their own cosmonauts at risk are only a fraction of the unsafe and unprofessional behavior we are witnessing every day from our near-peer competitors. And this only scratches the surface of what their total capabilities are and only a glimpse into how we expect to operate in the future. Space is different from the other domains. Our modern societies depend on space for our way of life and for the amenities we have all come to enjoy and to rely on. In space, there isn't a delineation of friend or foe, military or commercial, government or civil. No one will be immune from a conflict that extends into space. Additionally, Russia has openly stated that every space asset will be seen as a potential threat or a target regardless of its flag. We are all in this together. We're all competing for the same real estate, subject to the same physics, vying for the same orbital slots and spectrum allocation, and all subject to the same threats and environmental impacts of a conflict in space. Therefore, we must sound the alarm and generate a sense of urgency. We must reassess the way we operate in space, the way we think about the threat, the way we partner for the greater public good, and we must realign our resources accordingly. Today, the Space Force is the smallest military service and is funded at $30 billion a year. This is a bargain by any stretch of the imagination, but it was woefully inadequate to get after the increasing th threats that we are seeing and what is required for us to prepare for great power competition. The Space Force spent the past two years under, or the first two years under CSO number one, establishing our identity. We have spent the last two years focused on pivoting towards integrating into the joint fight and changing our culture. We are transforming to a warrior mindset laser focused on the threat. We are pivoting from service and system-focused force development to capability-focused force development. In an integrated and networked fashion, we are fielding resilient space capabilities. We are responding on operationally and tactically relevant timelines as demonstrated by placing the Victus Knox payload in orbit 27 hours after it was called up. 
an unheard of feat in space. We are achieving unity of effort through partnerships by partnering with ops and acquisition, partnering between Title 10 and Title 50, partnering with our international allies, partnering with industry through the, the commercial space office, and we are having transparent conversations and discussions on the Hill and with the administration. We are establishing component commands in each of the combatant commands. To date, we have established four, UCOM and AFRICOM, Indo-PACOM, CENTCOM, and US Space Command. And we are establishing the CONOPS, the TTPs, and the advanced training necessary to be a credible joint warfighting force. If you look back 24 months ago, we have come a, 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 we have come a long way, especially for the government. However, we have a lot more to do and time is running out. Under the label of re-optimizing for great power competition, the Secretary of the Air Force has been working to pivot the entire, and I mean the entire department of the Air Force, to getting after the near peer threat. Great power competition is more than just a bumper sticker. First, we started by crafting the seven operational imperatives with the first initiative being the space order of battle because space is the foundation of the joint fight and is the foundation for our way of life. If we lose space superiority, we lose the fight, period. Now under the Secretary's leadership, we've embarked upon a full-blown re-optimization of the Department of the Air Force. Our policies, organizational constructs, and processes must all improve to meet the near-peer challenge. In space, we are pivoting to a purpose-built space force under the four pillars of capability development people, readiness, and power projection. Under capabilities development, we are standing up the Space Force Futures Command. It is a new field command that forecasts the threat environment, develops and validates the operational concepts, and conducts experimentation and war games and performs mission area design. This includes strengthening our science and technology processes by prioritizing and streamlining s and so that the research labs can map their efforts more directly to our needed capabilities and overcome the valley of death. Under developing people, we are developing joint-minded warfighters war who can understand and act in the battle in the context of the space domain. We are redesigning career paths to produce guardians who meet its high-tech operational demands. We are creating the officer training path for new accessions and expanding the educational and development opportunities for all of our guardians military, civilian, and en or officer, civilian, and enlisted. We want everyone to learn what it means to be a guardian first before we steep them into their specific career fields. Under the transformational authorities granted us by Congress, we are creating a single full-time and part-time active duty Space Force under the Space Force Personnel Management Act. This will allow our guardians to transition between part-time and full-time as the Space Force mission allows and to meet life events and personal objectives. Under generating readiness, we are building the operational processes and training capabilities needed to prevail in today's increasingly contested environment. We are providing, providing guardians realistic threat-based training through robust operational test and training infrastructure. We are building live ranges to simulate the actual space environment and we are creating an intelligence-informed inventory of adversary capabilities and investing in high-fidelity, mission-specific simulators. Under the final category of projecting power, we are fully integrating our guardians into the joint force. We are formalizing the combat squadrons, which is our basic unit of action, and accelerating the implementation of the Space Force Generation model. This will drive realistic joint training, ensure effective security cooperation activities with allies and partners, enable seamless global collaboration with space enterprise, and standardize the presentation of space forces to the combatant commands. The CSO likens our transformation to the stand-up of the Navy from the Merchant Marine. The Merchant Marine was built originally for a benign maritime environment. But given the contested nation, na nature of the sea domain, the US Navy arose from it and achieved domain control. The Space Force was recreated to respond to an increasingly contested space domain. We are on a journey to forge a purpose-built Space Force to deter and if needed, 
defeat any rival in order to maintain control of the space domain. In order to accomplish this, our processes and our procedures must change accordingly. We must invest more in test and training, in space domain awareness, in command and control, and in the ability to control the domain. We must continue to break down the security barriers and build stronger partnerships with our allies and with industry. The SECAF has stressed, we cannot wait. We must be prepared for a contingency today. We must be prepared for the fight tonight. Today, we are committed globally in a broad spectrum of operations, ranging from combating terrorism, countering weapons of mass destruction, contingency operations in Ukraine and in Israel, to near-peer expansion and competition on the world stage. It makes it hard to focus the force, but we must. We must stay focused on the goal of completing the pivot to the great power competition. Space is a warfighting domain, and in order to, to ensure the security and the sustainability of the domain, the Space Force must be able to guarantee space superiority. Space superiority is our first core and foundation for everything we do, core function and foundation. A service must control its domain before they can access it and in order to exploit it. This means we must know what is happening in the domain and we must be able to credibly respond to aggression. This is a fundamental premise behind the CSO's theory of integrated deterrence and competitive endurance. Under the theory of competitive endurance, the Space Force needs to be resourced and postured for perpetual competition because the alternative to competition is conflict. And no one will prevail if conflict extends into space. In order, to in order to prevail through competitive endurance, the Space Force must execute on three core tenets. Avoid operational surprise, deny first mover advantage, and conduct responsible counter space campaigning. But space is huge and the Space Force is resource constrained. This brings me full circle to the messages I want to leave with, leave with you today. We are seeing more change than at any time in the history of space. There is more change coming as the Air Force and the Space Force continue to pivot towards re-optimizing for great power competition and competitive endurance. If you have been away from this mission area for more than 12 months, I argue your knowledge is dated. I challenge you to re-evaluate your assumptions and your understanding of space. Because the threat is real, it is determined, and it is capable. We are countering the threat with the world's greatest space force crafted and forged from the world's greatest air force. Space is an integral part of our economy and our way of life. Space enables the joint force to protect and defend the nation's interests worldwide. We must ensure we are properly resourcing the space force for competitive endurance to ensure we can guarantee space superiority well into the future. Today's Space Force is a bargain, but tomorrow's Space Force requires a ruthless prioritization of resources to ensure we can continue to enjoy the freedom of action in space that we have all come to depend on. You should be incredibly proud of your guardians and the changes they are making. Make no doubt about it, your Space Force is the greatest Space Force on the planet, and we're committed to keeping it that way. Semper Supra, and I'll take your questions. Uh, uh, General, I'll open up with a question, uh, and I'll certainly understand if there are aspects of this that you can't or don't want to answer. Uh, is there anything that can be shared of recent reports of the potential Russian plans to place nuclear anti-satellite weapons in orbit to blanket U.S. constellations? And if you can't answer that, is this at least an opportunity to educate the American people on the criticality and the relevance of the Space Force mission? I cannot commentate on, uh, comment on that uh, press release. I would recommend you talk to the National uh, uh, Command uh, Authority, National Security Council. Um, what I would leave the American public with is we are observing every sing single day unsafe and unprofessional behavior from our near peer competitors. That unsafe and unprofessional behavior, as I talked about, is absolutely committed to denying our ability to use space for peace and for defense, and they are starting to prove extremely capable at doing that. We have got to counter that threat to ensure that the space capabilities that we have come to depend on for our way of life will be there well into the future, 
and to make sure our children's children can enjoy the quality of life that we enjoy today. No worries. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Bob Winkler. Thanks for being here, sir. No worries. Uh, with respect to GMTI, right? It's, yes. it's been reported now that uh, with the passage of the NDAA, you're gonna the Space Force will own uh, operational tasking authority uh, and control of the GMTI constellation, right? as well as milestone decision authority for acquisition. So interestingly enough, it looks like then the NRO becomes an acquisition arm or a potential acquisition arm, at least in this particular case for the Space Force. If that's the case, should we look at that as a model going forward in the future? And if it is, what are the implications for MIP for your resource constraints that you brought up? So, uh, great question. So we have been partnering shoulder to shoulder with the NRO says to stand up to the Space Force in 2019. GMTI is not the first co-developed system that we have with the, G with, uh, the NRO. Uh, we have, other, we have uh, Silent Barker, which is, which is a system that uh, just got launched. We have other comm systems. We have uh, some collaborative OPIR systems, uh, 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 overhead persistent infrared systems. So this is not a new partnership that we're starting with GMTI. So we will continue to partner with the NRO when it makes sense. When it comes to GMTI, the technical expertise for that phenomenology rely, resides within the NRO and it makes total perfect sense to have them develop the system on behalf of the Space Force. And we have the, the milestone decision authority, like you said, within the uh, Space Force. We are funding that system through the Space Force across that month that, that toll was transferred into the NRO to do that. And we will continue to co-develop it and partner on that system going forward. Right in front of you. Hi, oh, Teresa, Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense. Nice to see you, sir. Um, my question is actually related to that, but it's at the broader issue. You mentioned Title 50 and Title 10. And I wondered if you could explain how the Space Force sees its Title 10 responsibilities for tactical ISR, um, vice the responsibilities, Title 50 responsibilities in the IC. And that would cover not just GMTI, but for example, acquisition, or um, provision of commercial data to commanders in the field, to the cutting, to the tactical edge. Could you talk about the, the broader separation? Uh, Absolutely, so if you, if you go back to the air model, JSTARS was the air model providing situational awareness to the combatant commanders from air. What we are doing is taking that air mission and elevating it into space, so it is no different. So from a Title 10 perspective, we have the exact same responsibilities to provide situational awareness to the combatant commander on tactically relevant timelines. So that's the way we're approaching the authorities. However, there is a lot of collaboration that can be gained by collaborating between Title 10 and Title 50, and by partnering with the NRO, partnering with the IC, we're able to start bringing those synergies to the table in a multi-domain command and control type manner. One more right here, sir. Hi, Shelly Mesh with Inside Defense. Good to see you. Um, we are almost six, halfway through the fiscal year without a budget. Um, how much of an impact has the CR had that even if you were to get a budget by the end of the month, would you be able to make up that time that has been spent waiting for that 10% increase that had been requested for FY24? So the, the, the CR uh, has created a significant strain on our ability to go as fast as we wanted. Uh, the Space Force is funded mostly by research and development dollars, so, so investment dollars. Uh, because we are so heavily uh, invested in the investment side, plus we saw a significant plus up from 23 to 24, all that capability has been held uh, waiting for the CRA, CRA to get through and has not progressed forward. So it has definitely slowed some of our programs down. It is to be, to be seen when the CRA is finally lifted how big that impact is going to be. That impact could be as big as $3.9 billion of Air Force or Space Force TOA and a $30 billion budget. That's about 14% of my buying power I could lose. And just to put that in perspective, we're looking at losing about seven national security space launches if we don't get the CR lifted. Hi, sir. Uh, here in the back, Courtney Albin with C4ISRnet. 
Uh, yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to ask, um, you started out talking about uh, the threat and um, this pivot toward uh, more resilient systems. Um, I wonder if you can speak um, even broadly about how we'll see that reflected in the 25 budget next week. And then also, um, you know, you've, you've talked about some of these themes for the last two years, particularly, um, you know, the, the re resilient space system side and, and kind of getting to a better place there by 2027. What's your you know, evaluation right now about of where the Space Force is at in that uh, push? The, the push towards resilient space systems has uh, increased significantly in the past two years as we've made this pivot towards resiliency. Uh, we are getting, there's many different ways to get after resiliency. You can harden the satellite, I can re make redundant systems, I can proliferate constellations, or I can build partnerships with allies and with commercial. We are going after all of that from a Space Force perspective to get after resiliency. So we have seen a significant improvement in resi resi resiliency as we've been progressing over the past couple years. Going into 25, you're gonna see more of the same when the budget rolls out next week. Uh, we are gonna continue to uh, increase and improve our resiliency, continue to uh, improve and increase our partnerships, and continue to increase and improve our capacity going forward. And that'll be rolled out next week. General Wright here. Uh, you talked about the tactically responsive situational awareness that you're taking up into uh, and providing support to those combatant commanders. Almost every combatant command that I'm aware of is pressing for both persistent ISR as well as redundancy for comms in the event of a loss of space-based systems. Uh, how does that interaction take place? Because the combatant commanders are asking for funding or pushing demand requirements on the acquisition system of the respective services that apply, whether it's maritime, whether it's in the Navy domain or it's in the Air Force domain or even the Army domain. What is that collaboration like? I'm assuming you don't oppose the aerial communications redundancy in the event of, or do you? We do not oppose the redundancy. That gets back to after some of the resiliency questions. I need that redundancy and my proliferation to increase my resiliency. So we don't oppose it at all. Uh, we are partnering with the combatant commands. You talked about tactically surveillance, reconnaissance, and tracking. For those of you that aren't tracking what that is, that is the purchasing of, uh, of data from industry, from commercial platforms, to provide situational awareness to the combatant commands. We are currently partnering with four separate combatant commands in that pilot program as we're going forward that will provide that commercial data to the combatant commanders. On the SATCOM side, we're also having conversations because when you get into the redundancy, we're gonna have government-owned systems, we're gonna have civil-owned systems, we're gonna have international-owned systems, and we're gonna have commercial-owned systems. I need all that redundancy to build out resiliency, if you will. What we've built into our commercial model right now is a working capital fund approach where the combatant commanders can actually bring their own funds to the table to buy additional commercial SATCOM over and above what I can provide them through the DOD side to give us that resiliency and that redundancy. I wore you guys out, that's awesome. <laughs> Everybody probably know my next question, but I'm not going to go there yet. Kind of, kind of glib, tongue in cheek, as I say this. You know, the Air Force was actually born out of the Army, uh, and some would say problem child. Others would say great break in, in relationship. Clearly, uh, for a lot of pieces, Space Com or Space Force is built out of a lot of the Air Force. How do you ensure that you're meeting all the needs of the different services? Is this a joint thing inside the Pentagon, or are you doing it strictly through the combatant commanders? Uh, good question. So all the above. We go straight to the combatant commanders. We have component commands, as I talked about, in each of the combatant commands. Uh, in some of them, we actually have acquisition liaisons as well that are communicating to the combatant commanders what capabilities are coming down the, down the line as well as what are their demands into our uh, capability development. So we, we've kind of connected that dot. I sit on the JROC, so I'm one of the JROC members in vetting the, the joint requirements. The Space Force was designated as the Joint Requirements Integrator for Space. So we have a direct feedback into the JROC of what the joint space requirements are and to integrate that into a joint space architecture. 
As always, the final question compound, if you had one more dollar, where'd you spend it, and what keeps you up at night? So that's my advantage of listening to General Collins I know, talk, no, so no, now no. I got the answer. The, General and Collins I'm not going to give it to the that, Marine Corps. He clearly had the best answer I've heard all day. I give him that. <laughs> hey, uh, if we had one more dollar, so it, it goes back into, you know, we have to be able to access the, the environment, we have to be able to control the environment, and then we have to be able to exploit the environment. The number one thing we got to do is protect and defend our cyber capabilities today, because the cyber capabilities are what drives everything that we do. So I would take one more dollar and immediately put it into cyber. After that, I would put it in, into space domain awareness so that I have better situational awareness of what is going on in the environment so that I can then get after space control to protect and defend our capabilities. Wait, we got one more. Make it quick. You got to be quick. Ten, ten Make it easy. Go. All right, I'll make it quick, sir. Uh, Captain Nick Ugarim, an acquisition officer for the Air Force. Uh, my question for you, sir, is uh, this is, we're sort of in an era of space race 2.0, um, except the industrial base for space capabilities is vastly different compared to space race 1.0. How are we leveraging the current, uh, more commercialized space-based industry today to get after some of the Space Force's prerogatives, and how are we uh, leveraging that to go faster and do things more effectively and then to grow our defense industrial base on the space side? Great answer. Great, great, great question. Not answer. Great question. Uh, so let me start with, um, our industrial base has been there for every conflict we've ever had since the beginning of the United States. They have bailed us out numerous occasions, as late as the Middle East with MRAP. So we've always had a very robust commercial market uh, with us. And if you look at what are our three core competencies, our three competitive advantages over our adversary, first and foremost is our industrial base. Second are our allies and our partners, and a third are our people, and the way our people innovate. Um, in the space commercial market today, we're seeing an enormous explosion of innovation, and it's outpacing everything else we've ever seen since the race to the moon. So what we are building in is a very robust commercial partnership through the Commercial Space Office to take advantage of those partnerships in a very synergistic manner. For example, standing up the commercial space augmentation. How do I, during peacetime, partner with commercial to ensure that I'll have that capacity during times of crisis or conflict? How can I share with them the threat data during peacetime so that I can help them protect and defend their systems uh, in peacetime so that I know that that capability will be there during times of crisis or conflict? How can I share with them during peacetime where we are going, going as a force so that they can invest their IRAD dollars in there to make sure I have that capability in the future? So we have a very robust partnership with our commercial industry. Thank you. Hey, so thank you very much, sir. It's another great round of applause. Thank you.